Me. Hello and welcome back, or welcome if it's your first time. I'll jump straight into this one. When he was 30 years old, Louis Le Bon lost the ability to speak, or speak in any matter that made any sort of sense. Upon being admitted to a hospital in suburban Paris that specialized in mental illness, he could only utter a single syllable, that syllable being tan. The syllable was often used with expressive hand gestures and varying pitch and inflection. One can think of Tan as being um, similar to Hodor, in a way. Tan was the only syllable that Le Bourne could pronounce. By the time he arrived at the hospital, he had been unable to speak properly for some two to three months, and even though his family thought the condition might be temporary, he had, after all, been dealing successfully with epilepsy for many years. Louis Le Bourne would remain there until his death, 21 years later. Apart from his inability to speak, Louis did not appear to exhibit any signs of physical or cognitive trauma. His intelligence seemed unaffected, his mental and physical faculties intact and responsive. He appeared to grasp everything that he was asked and he did his best to respond in a meaningful fashion. Though Tan, usually spoken twice, Tan Tan, remained the only thing he could say. Within 10 years, however, Le Bourne began to manifest other signs of distress. First, his right arm became paralyzed. Soon, his right leg followed suit. His vision deteriorated, his mental faculties as well. But to the point where Louis, aka Tan, as he came to be called, refused to get out of bed, and he remained that way for over seven years. In April 1861, Tan developed gangrene. His entire right side had become inflamed and he could hardly move. On April 11th, 1861, he was admitted to surgery and there he met for the first time a certain French physician, Pierre Paul Broca. Broca specialized in the study of language. Tan intrigued him. Gangrene aside, he decided to test the patient's faculties to see if he could determine the extent of his condition. Testing Tan's mental faculties turned out to be a relatively tricky business. He was right-handed. Not only could he not speak, but he couldn't write. Tan could, however, gesture with his left hand, and while many of the gestures were incomprehensible, when it came to numbers, he retained a surprising amount of control. He could tell the time on a watch to the second. He knew precisely how long he had been in the hospital. His faculties had indeed degraded, but he was, as in some ways, as sharp as he ever was. When it came to speech, however, Broca's main area of interest, Tan was hopelessly lost. Broca would later describe his condition as follows. He could no longer produce but a single syllable, which he usually repeated twice in succession. Regardless of the questions asked of him, he responded, Tan, Tan, combined with varied expressive gestures. This is why, throughout the hospital, he is only known by the name Tan. Broca termed the deficit aphemia, the loss of articulated speech. Today this condition is known as Broca's aphasia. On April 11th at approximately 11am, Louis Victor Le Bourne died. He was 51 years old. A biopsy of his brain revealed a large legion in the frontal area. Just a few months after Le Bourne's death, Broca happened to meet Lazar Lelong an 84-year-old grounds worker who was being treated at the same hospital for dementia. A year earlier, Le Long had, like Tan, largely lost the ability to speak. In contrast to Le Bourne's ever-present Tan, however, Le Long retained the ability to say several words that held real meaning, among them being yes and no, which I imagine was particularly helpful in trying to ask him questions. When Le Long died, his brain too was autopsied. What Broca found, a lesion that encompassed much the same area that had been affected in Le Bourne's brain, confirmed a suspicion that had been growing ever stronger in his mind. Our speech function is localized. That is, a specific area governs our ability to produce meaningful sounds. And when it was affected, we could lose our ability to communicate. What would remain intact, however, was the rest of our intelligence and language comprehension. Not only was speech function localized, but it could be dissociated into specific areas. Comprehension, production, formation. An injury to one part did not necessitate injury to others. So we could retain some functions, 
but lose others. Tan lost the ability to produce and form his own words, but he had no issues comprehending the same words being used by others. It wasn't until 1865, a full four years after the famed Tan autopsy, that Broker was finally ready to assert that speech production was localized in a specific part of the left frontal lobe, the region that now bears his name, Broker's area. By that time, he had described the brains of an additional 25 patients who suffered from Broca's aphasia and had come to conclude that speech articulation was indeed controlled by the left frontal lobe. However, that isn't the whole story. In the 1970s and 1980s, researchers determined that the surrounding frontal cortex and underlying white matter, the insula, the basal ganglia, parts of the anterior temporal gyrus, all seem to somehow involve speech production. So what Broca termed after himself was actually a much wider area of the brain than even he had anticipated. Still, the extent of Broca's contribution to psychology and neuroscience can't be underestimated because he underestimated the size of his area. His work set the stage for much of what we now term cognitive neuroscience and neuropsychology and two major principles that now govern how we think about the brain, the localization and the lateralization of function, and the notion that an impairment in one area of cognition, such as language, as a result of brain damage doesn't necessarily signify a general impairment in intellect, are in large part a result of Broca's pioneering work. Indeed, without Broca, our understanding of language would likely not have evolved as quickly as it did. Now, above and beyond all that, it was the fact that he looked at somebody whose brain wasn't healthy and determined that we could learn something by investigating an illness as opposed to merely locking them away. And that's perhaps his greatest legacy that we don't consider too often. And that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, found it interesting. And if you do, consider dropping a like and subscribing. Thanks for watching.